This week on ANN, the Executive Committee of the Seventh-day Adventist Church votes to attach the Ukrainian Administrative Office to the General Conference. Literature Evangelism Initiative celebrates 15 years of work. And in Papua New Guinea, the church partners with the government in the fight against type 2 diabetes. These stories and more coming up. Thank you so much for joining us this week. First in the news, the Executive Committee of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists voted unanimously on April 12 to attach the Ukrainian Union Conference, or UUC, the church's administrative region, covering the country of Ukraine directly to the GC until other comprehensive arrangements can be made. The GC is the administrative body located in Silver Spring, Maryland, that oversees the World Church. Previously, the UUC was part of the General Conference's Euro-Asia Division. The vote took place on the opening day of the 2022 Spring Meetings, one of the two annual business meetings of the denomination's top governing body between world sessions. This year's meeting took place virtually due to the COVID-19 pandemic. According to the action voted by the GC Executive Committee, the temporary attachment of the UUC to the GC is effective immediately and comes as a result of the current geopolitical matters that are causing administrative and mission challenges for the Ukrainian Union Conference and the Euro-Asia Division. President of the Seventh-day Adventist World Church, Ted N.C. Wilson said, in the context of current events, it has become very apparent that the Ukrainian Union Conference of the Seventh-day Adventists should be detached from the Euro-Asia Division and temporarily attached directly to the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. Please pray for God's leading in his work in Ukraine as the church follows in Christ's footsteps of ministering to people physically, mentally, socially, and spiritually during very challenging times. According to the GC Executive Committee voted action today, a 21-member Ukrainian Union Conference Oversight Committee chaired by GC General Vice President Artur Steele will provide direct guidance and supervision from the GC for denominational activities in Ukraine. In addition, according to the voted action, the UUC's attachment to the GC will be reviewed periodically to determine the best way forward for organizational and mission advancement. The Euro-Asia Division will continue its work of administering activities of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the rest of its assigned territory. Steele noted that it's important to remember that even in these circumstances, we are all God's children and want to be together when Jesus returns. He said, we have the same Father. We are looking to the same heavenly kingdom. Our people in ESD are members of the same family. They love each other. They care for each other and wish the best for each other and plan to be together in heaven, even with the change in structure, even while the horrendous situation has forced our people to be separated. They still pray for each other and look for a day when we will all be united with each other and will all together worship our Savior Jesus Christ face to face. In 2007, the Seventh-day Adventist Church in South America launched Impacto Esperanza, or Impact Hope. The objective is to deliver books on having hope throughout different circumstances of life to the population free of charge. Distribution is made in homes, businesses, and strategic points in each city and remote region. Each title has brought biblical answers on a wide range of subjects, such as emotional health, the fate of the world, the wise use of time, and peace in the face of COVID-19 pandemic which has affected the world since the beginning of 2020. The books produced so far for distribution in eight countries of South America already totaled more than 320 million copies in print, both Portuguese and Spanish. This number, however, does not include the digital versions that have also been shared. In 2022, the year in which the initiative celebrates 15 years since its launch, the book, The Final Hope by Clifford Goldstein, is being distributed as part of a global appeal based on the three angels' messages from Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. The president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in the territory, Pastor Stanley Arco, points out that in South America, Impacto Esperanza is now established in Argentina, Brazil, Bolivia, Chile, Ecuador, Paraguay, Uruguay, 
and Peru. However, the project has gone beyond South America and is reaching a global level. For ARCO, the focus is to announce the hope of salvation in Jesus Christ, even while living in a world full of trials and difficulties. As part of the Impact Hope Project, you can discover, read, and share books in 13 different languages by visiting the website sharinghope.com. Hundreds of Seventh-day Adventists gathered at the Bethany Seventh-day Adventist Church in Petionville, Haiti, to kick off two weeks of online evangelistic meetings as part of the culmination of dozens of evangelism efforts that began in January. The event is the first part of territory-wide efforts across churches in the French-speaking regions of the Inter-America Division. It includes Haiti, Martinique, Guadeloupe, and French Guiana, and is expecting thousands of baptisms as a result. Pierre Carporal, president of the church in Haiti, said, we are very happy to be able to organize this first international campaign together with the French Antilles Guiana Union. We have worked hard to plan, discuss, pray, and make decisions together doing the task that Christ has given us to share the gospel. Coined as Amen, Come Lord Jesus, the series will run through April 16th as part of the climax of comprehensive teamwork among the more than 200 district pastors and hundreds of laypersons who have worked to spread the message of hope and salvation through small group Bible studies and community impact activities. The keynote speaker is Pastor Vanel Louisant. The original plan was to have one campaign for both regions, but because of time differences and some safety concerns, the campaign in Haiti took place the first part of April and the French Antilles Guiana Union will hold its series from May 8th to the 22nd in Martinique. We continue to talk about evangelism and children. Started in 1992 and the first broadcast on KSOH 89.5 in Yakima, Washington, Live Talk Radio has been a powerful and practical resource, helping to change hearts by sharing the good news of Jesus Christ and connecting people with him. About a year and a half ago, the radio started broadcasting a streaming channel, especially for children, called Life Talk Kids. The channel airs uplifting music and numerous educational and Bible story programs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Kimberly Luce Moran, Assistant Director of, for the North American Division Office of Communication, talked with Life Talk Radio Manager and Director John Geely about the station's launch of Life Talk Kids. About starting children only programming, Julie said, listeners, our primary channel asked us about expanding our ministry to include a kids streaming channel. And we felt impressed that it was time to move forward. With lots of thought and prayer, we decided to launch lifetalkkids.net, a streaming channel dedicated to children's programming 24 7. To read the full interview with John Geely about Life Talk Kids, visit adventist.news. Coming up, the Adventist Church in Guatemala launches the first national school for literature. But up next, we have a new story on how almost 400 children were encouraged to become child evangelists. now because of this virus. For now, <laughs> it's just nice to hear your voice and see your face. Nothing beats playing outside in the dirt though. Which reminds me. Are your hands clean? Yes! Yeah. Mommy and Daddy says not a lot of kids get COVID-19. But it's always nice to be extra safe. We should wash our hands before picking our nose. <laughs> Wash 
washing our hands protects us, but it also keeps us from spreading the virus. In case we touch something dirty, let's always be clean and safe, okay? Love, Joey. We are going from North America to the Southeast region of Brazil, where around 400 children participated in Evangelismo Kids 2022. The event also brought in Dia Parari, Espiritu Santo, parents and Sabbath school teachers from all over the Brazilian state. According to the organizers, the objective is to encourage and motivate children and teenagers to become missionaries. In addition to being challenged to preach, each participant received a t-shirt and a backpack with materials to help them develop as a child evangelist. The Evangelismo Kids 2022 is also a pilot for the implementation of the project in the states of Minas Gerais and Rio de Janeiro. With lots of lights, games, and songs, the program was based on these four pillars, missionary duos, small groups, children preaching, and intercessory prayer. And it is on this topic that you will watch the story of Raphael Miranda, who overcame cancer because of intercessory prayer. The Adventist Church in South America sent this report. Querido Papai no Céu, Obrigado pela vida, mas nem tanto pela saúde. Hoje acordei um pouco da dói. Me sinto um pouco cansado e sem ânimo. Tudo que eu fazia antes agora parece bem difícil. Comer, brincar, estar com outros amiguinhos e até ir à igreja. Minha oração hoje é para que algum dia eu volte a te agradecer pelo milagre de ter minha saúde de volta. Ninguém está preparado para ter um câncer. Ninguém está preparado para receber a notícia de uma família, um familiar, um filho seu com câncer. Eu, a princípio, fiquei meio que estado de choque, sem acreditar. Quando eu comecei a contar para a família, houve um desespero. Algo muito forte me dizia que ia abalar as nossas relações. A minha relação com Deus, a minha relação com o mundo. Receber esse diagnóstico nos primeiros dias foi muito difícil para mim, porque eu não sabia lidar com isso. E eu não estava preparado emocionalmente e espiritualmente. Foi muito preocupante. As primeiras vezes que eu perdi meu cabelo foi quando eu fiquei internado pela primeira vez por causa de uma ferida. Eu sempre tive um cabelo muito macio, liso, e eu gostava muito dele. A imunidade dele caiu muito e a gente já era direcionado. Se a criança tiver febre, imediatamente hospital. 11 horas da noite eu já recebi o diagnóstico que poderia ser fatal. A qualquer momento ele poderia vir a óbito. O meu marido não estava preparado para perder ele. Ficamos ali naquele momento de desespero e ele se jogou no chão em oração e clamou, Senhor, salva o meu filho. E eu já tinha contactado o pastor, grupos de igreja, vários, aquele movimento de oração. Eu orava muito a Deus e eu achei que eu não ia sobreviver. Mas Deus sempre foi meu amigo fiel, sempre segurando a minha mão. Alguns momentos eu duvidei, alguns momentos eu tinha certeza. Alguns momentos eu era feliz, alguns momentos eu era triste. O médico disse que o Rafael poderia não sobreviver. Mas Deus, todo poderoso, tinha outros planos para ele. Cada momento é uma confirmação da vitória e do poder de Deus ter agido nas nossas vidas. O Rafael foi curado por Deus. Eu consigo sentir verdadeiramente, ter certeza de que Deus está comigo desde aquela vez de que eu fiquei internada. Papai do Céu, 
Obrigado pela cura. Agora eu sei que não sou como as outras crianças. Porque crianças não lutam contra gigantes. Eu não só lutei como venci o gigante do câncer. Obrigado pela vida e pela saúde. Em nome de Jesus. Amém. After a set of challenges, policy changes, and dwindling number of literature evangelists affecting the publishing ministry in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Guatemala, church leaders gathered to reestablish a permanent literature evangelism school. More than 150 literature evangelists and active church members met in Chiquimula, Guatemala to be equipped, inspired, and to recommit to spreading the gospel in their communities through books and publications. The new Literature Evangelism Training School, appropriately named Messengers of Hope, attracted the moderately sized group, mostly made up of dozens of new interested members who want to become full-time or part-time literature evangelists in the country. They were challenged to be the force that will strengthen publishing ministries, working closely with pastors in the mission of evangelizing thousands of people who are in need of hope and salvation in Jesus. The president of the church in Guatemala, Pastor Gondia Garcia, said he knows that the church will benefit greatly with this army of workers prepared to enter new territories with the message of the three angels. He also highlighted that leaders from each of the eight conferences and missions are revising policies for literature evangelists and the benefits that they will be eligible to receive. The Seventh-day Adventist Church in Papua New Guinea has launched the Save 10,000 Toes campaign in a bid to reduce type 2 diabetes cases and other lifestyle diabetes in the country by 2030. The campaign is an initiative of the health department, but will also involve church members working in partnership with government health workers and other stakeholders. The campaign was launched at the Papua New Guinea Union Mission Office in Leh by Morobe Provincial Health Authority Chief Executive Officer Dr. Kipas Binga. Dr. Binga said the Save 10,000 Toes campaign was timely as lifestyle diseases were on the rise and the initiative would help the Morobe Provincial Health Authority with its corporate plan to address the increase in lifestyle diseases and other health issues. Through their representatives, the New Zealand and Australian governments pledged their support for the campaign. Some of the activities in this initiative include training ambassadors to lead the campaign, doing health assessments in villages and towns for blood pressure and blood sugar levels, conducting trainings on health improvement programs, running stop smoking and health education programs, and a media campaign. Coming up, Ashley Chisholm is here for This Week in Adventist History. But up next, Adventist Mission shares the story of a young man whose life was changed by Pathfinders. Life was falling apart. My wife and I were getting a divorce, and I couldn't handle it. Hopelessness filled every waking moment. Then one night, I felt impressed to turn on the TV, and this man was there, preaching about heaven. The sermon was so beautiful just for me. I cried, but not tears of pain. They were tears of joy. God sent me a message of hope just when I needed it. We may look, pray, read, think, worship, sing, and share differently, but we all look forward to the Sabbath, and we all look forward to the future when Jesus will come again. With this message in mind, we arrived at a core component for a new identity system, the creation grid, a simple seven column structure for layout. The grid is a reference both to the prophetic timeline as well as to the creation week that culminated in the seventh day Sabbath. The first six columns of the grid belong to the designer. They can be filled with anything, text, images, illustrations, patterns, and logos. But the seventh column, the Sabbath column, does not belong to them. It is meant to be different and special. Regardless of what or where you are designing, you can always find information to help you communicate that we are all Seventh-day Adventists.
Welcome back. When Ricardo was 10, he had an accident and he began to lose his eyesight. After a while, Ricardo practically lost all of his eyesight and the doctors gave his parents no hope. Despite all of this, Ricardo did not give up. He accepted Jesus and wonderful things happened and continue to happen in his life. Let's see how God is working in Ricardo's life today. When Ricardo was 10, he had an accident while jumping over a fence. He didn't notice the thin metal wire on the other side of the fence and it caused him to hit the ground head first. After the accident, he began to lose his sight. At school, he had trouble seeing what the teacher wrote on the chalkboard, so he asked to sit in the front row. After a while, he couldn't even see from there. Finally, the teacher sent him home, saying the school could not teach a blind boy. Ricardo's parents took him to many doctors, but none could help him. They said he would never see again. Ricardo was very sad. He could no longer play soccer, ride a bicycle, or play hide-and-seek with his friends. When he went outside, he could hear his old playmates making fun of him. The boys and girls thought that their jokes were harmless, they didn't know that their words were hurting Ricardo. He felt hopeless. One day, an older cousin invited Ricardo to go to a Pathfinder outing. The cousin was the leader of a Pathfinder club. Ricardo didn't want to go, but his cousin kept insisting, so he finally went. He was surprised that he could participate in many of the Pathfinder activities. His cousin even asked him to help out. Ricardo felt needed. He felt good. A short time later, Ricardo heard a sermon that made him want to give his heart to Jesus. But then trouble struck. At the baptismal class, the teacher asked Ricardo and the others who wanted to be baptized to memorize the Ten Commandments. But Ricardo couldn't read the Bible or the piece of paper with the Ten Commandments that the teacher passed out. He sadly thought that he would not be able to get baptized. At home, his mom encouraged him. God willing, you will get baptized, she said. During the week, his older sister read the Ten Commandments out loud to Ricardo. She read them again and again so he could memorize them. On Friday, everyone who wanted to be baptized gathered at the church. Who will be the first to recite the Ten Commandments? A church elder asked. No one else volunteered, so Ricardo raised his hand. He recited all ten perfectly. The elder was amazed and shook his hand. Turning to the others, he asked, Who will recite like Ricardo? The next day, on Sabbath, everyone was baptized, including Ricardo. Shortly afterward, he was invited to share the weekly mission story in Sabbath school. When some church members heard, they asked the Sabbath school leader to change his mind. Ricardo can't tell the mission story because he can't read, they said. The Sabbath school leader gently touched Ricardo on the shoulder. Do you hear what they are saying? He asked. Ricardo nodded. Show everyone what you are able to do, he said. Prepare to tell the story next Sabbath. Ricardo's sister read the mission story to him from the Mission Quarterly, and he easily memorized it. On Sabbath, Ricardo told the story from beginning to end. When he finished, loud and astonished amens filled the church. Today, Ricardo is a 25-year-old university student and is preparing to become a pastor. He has led a Pathfinder club for the past two years, and he preaches regularly in churches around Angola. Dozens of people have been baptized after hearing his sermons. Your generous offering will help build a school in Ricardo's hometown of Luanda, Angola. Pray that the work of the school results in others like Ricardo who are eager to teach others about Jesus. Thank you for your support of mission. Watch this and other mission stories online by visiting adventismission.org and clicking on videos at the top.
And finally, for today's episode, let's turn to Ashley Chisholm for a look at Adventist history. This week, we're going to hear the story of Reuben H. Nightingale, born in Escondido, California, and he worked for the Voice of Prophecy founder, Pastor HMS Richards. Welcome to This Week in Adventist History. On April 10th, 1969, Reuben H. Nightingale, then president of the Central Union Conference in the North American Division, left on a trip that would take him to various places, including Guam, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Hong Kong, the Philippines, Singapore, and Indonesia. Nightingale had speaking engagements, visited Adventist institutions, and attended mid-year meetings of the Far Eastern Division. Nightingale was born December 7, 1910, in Escondido, California. He grew up there, attending Glendale Union Academy and working at Glendale Sanitarium before studying to become a minister at Southern California Junior College, a forerunner of today's La Sierra University. After graduation, he worked with HMS Richard Sr. in an evangelistic crusade. Marrying Pauline Woodyard in 1933, Reuben and she lived in California, Washington, Oregon, and Florida as he pastored churches in those places. In Florida, he was elected as conference president, his first administrative position. In 1954, Nightingale became president of the Northern Union Conference, and in 1962, president of the Central Union Conference, the position he held until his death on March 4, 1975. You can see Nightingale here in an image from near the time of his death. The Central Union Reaper, the paper of the Union Conference Nightingale was president of, is full of his reports from his 1969 trip. You can find the issues of that periodical in our online archives, documents.adventistarchives.org. Nightingale's story comes from this week in Adventist history. Thanks for watching ANN. Join us next week for more news from the headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Did you know that the Adventist Church has a YouTube channel where you can watch a and video, a and In-Depth, and plenty of other amazing videos on prophecy, health, and Bible study? Just go to YouTube and search for the Adventist Church. Make sure you click the subscribe button so that you never miss a new video. And remember to leave a comment or a prayer request. We have people who are praying for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Before we say goodbye, Here's some good news from the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verse 3. The passage says, Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. And that's our program for this week. And remember, you can always visit Adventist.news for daily news and videos. Until next time, God bless. Take care.